Welcome to Discover Energy Work. I'm Richard Wicks, and today I have Simon Heathcote. It's uh, going to be an interesting time with Simon. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to come up, but Simon is a psychotherapist, and uh, he's a writer. And what brings a whole new, different perspective on it is he's also looking at how the planets and the stars affect us as well from from some point of view, it's fair mm. to say. Um, sure. So, well, great that you've uh, come, Simon. It was great meeting you in Thailand and, and uh, sharing yeah. some commonality with you then. How are things? Very good. I, I, I am enjoying this time of peace and the skies being clear and you know, I'm, I'm getting fit and healthy, uh, which was a long time coming, and I feel great. I'm, I'm Brilliant. enjoying life. Now, you know, um, with the podcast, the idea is to kind of bring people on and, and tell them, um, like, you know, how, how people made a, a journey to get to where they are. And I understand, like, you were telling me that you were, a, like, a Fleet Street journalist. Is that right? Mm. Well, I worked in regional papers. I was an editor of the, the paper I started out in my hometown, and I did travel writing for the broadsheets later on. So I, I, I became a travel writer at one point, yeah. Right. But I was so you, working in therapy by that point. Uh, right. So, so it was you, a bit of both. Yeah, I mean, how did that happen? I mean, it's, it, number one, when I was at school, they said two things don't do. Don't become an actor and don't become a journalist. Is that like that's the hardest things to do? So, well, I think in my case, Rich, it was because the one thing I was good at at school was writing. You know, I oh, I think I won a when I was ten. I won a county nature diary prize. So I did this journal for a few months, and I got this award. And I was always writing poems as a kid, and language was always easy for me. But you know, put me in front of a statistics or a graph or something, and I haven't got a clue. So English and history were the kind of things that I went for. And um, so it became logical for me later on when I went to university and came out the other side, I did a degree in communication studies to go into journalism. And right. uh, although the course I did was in, it didn't turn out to be quite what I thought it was. It actually was Marxist critical theory. So it was looking at the, the press as a bad thing, which I think today a lot of people would agree with. So, you know, but I went into newspapers and uh, I won a feature writing award on the paper for the Midlands. I was in Worcestershire. And then I got hoisted onto this very big newspaper, which terrified the life out of me. I, I went from a little newsroom with five people into a, a floor with a hundred journalists on. And it was a mm. huge, huge leap, you know. And, a, and, and part of my journey was also at that point, I was trying to give up boozing because I was a drinker. So that was that was part of mine. I'll go into that the trauma that really started that started that whole thing. So I was just kind of coming out of that at that point as well, but that put me back in it. So I had this very strange thing where I was kind of not in a great place, but also um, writing some really good stuff, you know. And I had I had, I thought at that point I was. I was going to be the great writer, you know, my ego was in very much in the ascendant thing. I was going to be this enormous writer and I had everyone telling me what a great writer I was. And I ran a, won awards and all that stuff. Mm. But life didn't go that way. You know, life went another way. And it, and it went into the journey of healing and recovery and all the stuff that we know and talk about and really exploring many other aspects of life. You know, I'd always been asking the deeper questions of life. And interesting, thinking about astrology, just to say this, that the astrologer we would say is a gemini energy asking questions wanting to communicate wanting details but opposite gemini you have sagittarius which is the philosopher which wants to know the deeper meaning of life is not so interested in the details mm. and i was always more of the philosopher than the natural journalist you know I, and, and so mm. my life kind of changed into well how do i explore this very this part of me that really wants to understand the meaning of life was always asking those big questions and so as I got into my own healing and recovery it was natural to begin to think about well maybe I could do this you know maybe I could be asking questions to help heal people can I can I ask the difficult question so oh. so for some people drinker doesn't mm. it's, it's alcoholism yeah so it's sure. being an alcoholic sure and um, was there a moment where you realized you woke up and went, I've got a problem. 
Or I think there were a number of moments. Yeah, yeah. There were a number of moments where I kind of went, oh, wow, this isn't so good. I mean, I think even from a very young age, I was, I was, I mean, at 14, I was having blackouts. So I was pretty hardcore very, very mm-hmm. early on. And really it came from, and I'll go into this, a very, very difficult family situation where mm-hmm. the only way I could deal with it was to mask the heat, is try and cover my pain. And right. alcohol, you don't, you know, you don't have to go into, I don't feel like I want to, you know, put you under pressure to uh, sure, sure, release sure. anything which is too personal. Like, it's, sure. we have like, you know, I don't know, unlimited numbers of millions of people that might watch this. And for me, I mean, of course, you know, drinking is self-medication. Um, but at Absolutely. 14, at 14, like, mm. um, yeah. I think um, well, alcohol does two things very well, Rich. It, it kills pain and it augments pleasure. It's a wonder drug in that in that respect, and it really did that for me. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I needed that. You so know. we're talking like you're at school, mm-hmm. uh, at fourteen. You're getting drunk at school mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. during the day. Well, I would, I, would, I would stay at a friend's house because I lived half an hour from school. I lived oh, okay. in a place called Malvern and I went to school in Hereford. A lot of us got the train every day. So I would find reasons and excuses to stay over. And I would stay with a friend and we would get drunk. And then I would, uh, at one point I broke my leg and I was staying in a boarding house at school. So, you know, that became an opportunity as well. So I, I kind of found my moments, shall we say, to, to uh, get out of control what I really wanted did you find um because I'm thinking of I forget who it is was it um the the famous um a poet who was on opium and you know did you find inspiration by sinking into the abyss of nothingness no I, I, that's not how it was for me. And I know some people, it spurs their creativity. Mm. But for me, it was a killer. You know, I don't, I don't think, other than getting high, uh, which obviously I loved, uh, it did me any good at all. So it certainly didn't spur my creativity. I'm, you know, and I think most people who get sober will tell you this, you know, they're much more creative when they put the bottle down. Mm. As, as I have been. So what was the... I mean, do you feel this is the core of where your your journey to psychotherapy and becoming a healer begins? Really? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I would say, you know, I've been in, in, in what they call in recovery now for thirty two years. So I'm much longer than you know I was ever drinking, or you know, I mm. stopped at twenty six. I'm now fifty, maybe fifty eight. Mm. Um, no, for me, it, it was much, much deeper. It was. It was really you know from very early on in life where you know I had a father who was an Irish Catholic born in the poorhouse in Dublin illegitimately and I had a mother who was a Christian missionary's daughter born in India so it was so it was a Protestant English Irish Catholic kind of schism between the Mm. two of them it wasn't Mm. a marriage that lasted long so for me there were huge what I would call huge archetypal forces at play you know, there was the war between the Irish and the English, the Catholics and the Protestants within this mix. So, you know, as I as I got into my healing and my journey and started to have to look deeper, you know, because I had a deep, deep pain inside me. I had to look a lot deeper. Mm. You know, I, I had to start to understand archetypal psychology. You know, what, what was happening to me that was was not even personal. It was something much, much bigger. I was caught in this kind of generational, cultural battle, if you like. So that, we, that was where it started. Right. Can we go back to that point? I mean, because I sure. mean, these are, these are, these are, you know, prof- profound words. Um, mm. But, you know, somebody like at 14, you've got this, these archetypes. Mm. I mean, is it violence? Is it, is it fighting the system? Is it hopelessness? Is it, you know, self um, all of that, I thought, would say, Richard. Thoughts? All oh, right. So, so what were you doing? I think all of that. Well, I, saw, well, I was a little git. I was horrible. I was really horrible. Yeah, I was yeah. horrible. I don't. I. Hmm, I think. I think. I think I always had an intensity about me, for sure. That was certainly scary for my mother and stepfather, who later came along. Uh, I think I was always a truth seeker. 
So I was always wanting to know what happened, you know, why I didn't see my father anymore, mm. you know, what, you know, and that mystery went on for many, many years. I mean, there were things I discovered when I was 40, you know, which I'll tell you about if you want to later, but there, there was a, there was a lot of secrets. There was a mystery hidden in this. In fact, okay. last year I discovered I had an elder brother in Australia who's a senior lecturer in, uh, as you do, in in sociology at, at uh, the Sydney University. Sorry, philosophy. He is a mathematical philosopher at Sydney University, and we met online. I saw him on Ancestry website. Thirty minutes later, we were on Skype together. He said, "I've been looking for you for years, and you know, uh, now I, we meet, and suddenly we're brothers." Wow. So this happened in a half hour span, a year and a half ago maybe two years ago now. And my father had children with, with uh, five women, seven kids with five women, and he was mm -hmm. the first, I was the second in the second relationship. So there was a, something deeply hidden, and we're still looking for who my father's father was in Ireland. You know, who is this grandfather that we right. don't know? We're getting close to finding out with DNA and everything. But So there was a deep mystery in the whole Irish side of things, you know, like happens to a lot of Irish people who are born illegitimately. Mm -hmm. Hmm. There was also the mystery of my mother's family in India at the time Gandhi was killed and, and who fled India in fear on a boat four months later, three, three weeks later. So there was a lot of interesting stuff in my family on both sides. And a lot of it didn't get talked about. I didn't know what had happened to my father and mother. Uh, I just suddenly had a stepfather. So there were a lot of things people wanted to sweep under the carpet. Now, those things made me crazy angry. You know, you, you push enough hmm. stuff inside a kid. Mm. you're going to get rage and volcanic eruptions. So I mm. could certainly have my eruptions. Mm. But it was it was the pressure of all that that was in my unconscious, in the collective unconscious that was inside me, that at a deep level, at a soul level, I knew about, but at a conscious level, I didn't. Mm. So, you know, a human being can know things from their family DNA, from their own karma, carried inside them, but it doesn't mean they know it consciously. So... So that journey to make, you know, I think all psychotherapy is making conscious what's in the unconscious. Um, you know, that's what my journey has been about. So it's been me trying to un unravel and uncover the family mm. secrets mm. and also then going into helping other people do that. You know, it's like, you know, why are you the scapegoat? You know, because I certainly was. And I was a scapegoat because I was the truth seeker and no one wanted to know the truth. Mm. And I like to work with people who are in this position because I understand it very well. You know, so my work, that's why I'm answering your question the way that I am. My, my thing isn't about alcoholism. No. It's about something much deeper. It's about a journey to truth. Mm. And alcohol, as for many people, was the means by which I soothed the pain of, of the ignorance that was put upon me. You know, mm. so, so it's been an interesting journey. And, and that's, that's why I work deeply with people and I work with the soul, because for me, these are soul issues. You know, they're issues of the deep soul, they're issue of, of your own karma, they're issues of your ancestry, they're issues of what's been hidden culturally, as in kids being shipped to Australia, for instance. In fact, my father was told we were going for a new life in Australia, so we ought to sign the adoption papers. So there's that whole movement of, you know, as we see in the world now, abuse of children, whether it's emotional, physical or sexual, denial of the truth, you know, all the things that are being uncovered at the moment globally. Right. So I had a feel for that inside me. Was this expressed, I mean, this, um, I mean, I'm learning this right now. So I'm on the fly and I'm going. Sure, um, sure. We can fly together. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm hearing uh, this mysterious, mysterious secret force, yeah, behind your existence, yeah, mm -hmm. essentially a father mm -hmm. figure that that is there and not there. Um, yeah, he's present but not present, sure. and his ghosts um, loom large over over many things. Right, and then um, a certain um, um, panic in leaving India, you know, like just That's dropping right. everything uh, a yeah. certain like trauma there the and then diaspora yeah yeah um i don't know what a diaspora is but diaspora is when people have to flee their country you know oh, big okay. movements of, of you know people from one country to another right good and then um you as a f you you sort of say with 14 you are medicating yourself so mm -hmm. what at what point did you was there something that said, like, okay, I got a, I need to talk to somebody that in a different way. Where, where were you? Well, 
let me when think that decision about that. was made were you in a, well, in a ditch or were you, you know were you just well i did i did end up in some ditches for sure right, but uh, right. there there was um let me think how i answered that the because there was so much denial in my family, my mother and stepfather wanted to pretend the past hadn't happened. So for instance, I would have to go to school and lie and, and pretend this new guy was my father. That's how severe it was. So there was a lot okay. of shame in that. So right. I would be constantly having to live a lie, which would of course make me furious. But that wasn't accepted at home because the lie had to be upheld. And so, you know, when it came to my drinking, you know, I hid it, first of all. I only, at that young age, could only do it sporadically because I didn't have access to funds. So I, they didn't see much of it. They saw some of it. But when they did, they kind of just blamed me for it. There was no any chance of any help or any understanding or anything like that. So I was very much alone with it. Hmm. So, um, but, you know, it was severe very early. You know, I was in big problems because it was... I was medicating like crazy. Um, but uh, I think by the time I was 21, but you know, I was I'm thinking in the help. UK, like, you know, the how, um, like the pub culture, like you can go down there and drink 12 pints of an evening and you're normal, yeah. you know? So, I mean, it's like, uh, maybe there's people... Yeah, they are normal you, to drink you, 12 pints. But you, I mean, you, you make a very good point, Richard, because... A lot of the problems with drinking at a young age is the camouflage and your camouflage by just the reason you said that your peers are drinking when you're at university and at school that, you know, and so no one really notices that your drinking is slightly different. But I was, you know, the thing noticeable thing about my drinking, I was always the one in all the stories the next day. You know, if there was, if there was a story from the night before, you can bet your bottom dollar I'd be in the center of it. So, my drinking was different. And, and as I got to understand what alcoholism was, I realized that the loss of control I experienced was completely different to other people. And the change in my personality, you know, I had become wildly funny. I would take my clothes off in bars and I would, you know, do all sorts of stuff. So there was something happening, you know, and as a psychotherapist, I understand that it was happening in my deep unconscious. Right. This disturbance that I was carrying from my family was coming out when I drank, you know, and that, that was the release in a way. That was the other function of the drinking. It was to release what was inside me because there was no other outlet. There was no one to talk to. There was no understanding. There was nothing. There wasn't an ally, you know, so my father had gone. My mother had kind of mm. really turned her back on me and had to handed all her power to this stepfather mm. who really ruled the roost with a rod of iron. So, mm. you know, there was conflict at home. There was, you know, so, you know, in many ways, you know, my story, it was pretty horrific. But the reality is I've come out of it incredibly well. But it took me a lot of work and a long time. And, and I want to say to people, whether it's alcohol, whatever, there is, there is hope. You know, you can get out of this stuff. But I was driven, you know, to become conscious. You know, I had an incredible drive to wake up from this stuff. I, I'm curious, you know, because... Um... I don't know if you know of this um, um, book by um, Cameron, Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way. Sure. Yeah. Where she asks you um, to write a journal. That's right. You yeah, write morning pages, three yeah. pages every day. That's right. And you That's write right. Flow of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I did it. I did it. Um, actually, I did it when, you know, after my daughter died, I'd like, okay, I've got to do something. Yeah. And I, yeah. I did things, you know, I, I took um, supplements, um, you know, B supplements to help the brain and so on. And mm -hmm. I, I started mm -hmm. the artist's way. And I mm -hmm. felt like it was doing something, just like just mm -hmm. writing. Did you find a certain amount of, of healing through your writing, this creative? creative? Well, I, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because I've done bits of the artist way as well. And I've done morning pages many years ago now, probably 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't the form of writing that really helped me. But writing, you know, my own creative writing, I think you've seen some of the articles and stuff I've written. You know, writing can really, I very rarely these days, I'm not a moody person. I don't have bad moods. I don't have great highs and lows anymore, which is hysterical considering my life used to be full of highs and desperate lows. Hmm. I'm very even now. And uh, 
Um, but if I have any any kind of negativity or anything, if I write within an hour, I can be lifted much much higher. So mm. writing for me is an absolutely, and I'm glad you you picked this up, is a vehicle for healing. One of the best ones, and you know, often looking, I was doing someone's astrology yesterday, and. Uh, you know, saying, look, if you've got your Pluto, which in evolutionary astrology we see as the soul in the 11th house, one of the outlet points is always looking to the opposite of the chart. So in the fifth house, which is the archetype of Leo, that points to creativity as the answer to the dissociation of the, of the 11th house. Okay. So, you know, getting people to move into their creativity is a large part of what I do, you know, encouraging people to find what it is that they want to do what brings them joy what stimulates them as part of the healing because it's you know it certainly works for me it's fascinating because you've got this uh, whole thing going on with what i'm talking about i'll say like um one of the maybe oldest recording recorded forms of energy work yeah mm. a divination through the planets yeah mm. uh, the energies of the planets you know and their vibration their vibrations mm -hmm. and resonances mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, whether, um, whether people can understand it or not, there's incredible um, coincidences in the way, you know, there's yeah. the, the planets are, are set up with certain vibrations and so on. But um, yeah. when did you, um, I'm trying to get down, down to these aha moments or these, these, mm. these mm. turning points where you've gone, yeah. well, you know, something's got to change or that the way we're looking at this is all wrong. You know, the, the way I'm approaching this is all wrong. I need to do something else. Yeah. Um, and I've had literally had people have a voice inside, tell them, yeah. Uh, they've come on the show and said, I got this voice. You need to do this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's again, it's, you know, we're on the same wavelength here because I, I do a technique people call soul mapping. And the soul map is looking at the key turning points in a life, you know, so I get people to map out on a bit of paper, what were the, what were the turning points in your life for good or ill accidents, illnesses, injuries, abandonments, betrayals, what were the things that marked the soul? So for me, the first one was three in hospital after my father left and, uh, with pneumonia dying of grief and, and, uh, shooting I my abiding childhood memory was being floating around in the universe attached to nothing it was many years later that I discovered in a regression that a boy who'd been bullying me on the ward it was my third birthday had put his hands up my pajama leg so it was a minor sort of sexual assault which had propelled me out of my body so I was I was in the void you know I was in this in, in this uh, you know that was the first kind of soul part of my soul map was that three-year-old mm. shamanic experience really of not being in a body of mm. floating around in the universe attached to nothing being totally terrified um you know and my my what i believe about so you experience. shot out of your body yeah it was like i was i was in the dark somewhere right up up in the top of the heavens you know it, in the void wow you know. Wow, and amazing. I think I came, I came back with a lot of fear, and I think I also brought back some gifts with me. Mm. You know, because I think I wrote, and if you saw the piece I sent you, I wrote in there about, you know, um, an arc, and 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 I've noticed with many therapists who haven't had really deep experiences, they work in a quite limited way, and and I think my work with the soul with people corresponds to that journey right into the heights. It's like a kind of circumference uh, within I, which I work. Can I cut, you, cut in a second? Mm -hmm. And because of course you can. I am one of these people, and probably annoying people, yeah, <laughs> that goes... <laughs> would we'll never goes, say that about you, Rich. What? <laughs> I mean, well, I'm, I'm okay with it, because it's, it's, this, is, this is who I am. It's like somebody said to me, um, I think I was talking to Jeffrey Mishlove the other day, and he said, yeah. um, you need to... Um, um, make a strong intention. I said, so how do you make a strong intention? Yeah. And um, I'm, you know, like, well, what a silly question, but no, I'll ask that question. So what is a soul? Yeah. What is a soul? I mean, I, I think so many people, we use well, soul all yeah. the time and I don't even, yes. I'm not and, really and I thought sure. You would, I thought you were going to ask me this. And 
Yeah, and I, and I think it's interesting because one of the people who really inspired me, because my, my business, Soul Vision, is very much about restoring soul to psychology. That's what I've got as my kind of mission statement, if you believe in such things, you know, restore mm. soul to psychology. Because if you do a psychology degree or course these days or train as, as a psychologist, you won't get a lot of soul in your curriculum. You know, you'll get a lot of statistics and data and theory. But yep. You won't get this thing called soul or psyche, which, of course, is what psychology means, study of the soul. So, you know, things are always hidden in plain sight, in my experience. So if something's saying psychology of the soul, why the hell aren't we doing it? So for me, it's like I want to bring people back into awareness of soul. Now, question, what is soul? Very good question. You know, one of the books that really inspired me with my business was a book called The Soul's Code by James Hillman. And he says at one point, and I wish I could find the passage, you know, hold concepts very lightly. You know, he says people are always trying to pin him down to concepts. And he says, don't go there. Hold it very lightly. So I'll just preface what I'm saying with that. I, I think people, as you're saying, use the words ego, soul and spirit in different ways. And I kind of like that. I mean, I'm reluctant to try and pin it down. But if I was to, I would say for me, soul is about essence. You know, what, mm. it, you mm. know, and Nissa Gadata, the great sage said, you know, find the one who was with you at your birth and who will be with you at your death. What is that? Mm. That is you. You know, what is this consciousness or soul that is with you at the time of your birth and who will be with you at your death? Because mm. that is what we really are, you know, beyond this form. We are, we are, and that's why people who are 90 say I still feel 18, because consciousness doesn't age, the soul doesn't age. Mm. So, you know, and I don't know if that's an adequate answer to you, but I, you know, for me, I kind of hold it quite loosely. But for me, if we think about soul as the individual expression of spirit coming into the earth, and spirit is about the universal expression of soul descending. So I see spirit and soul as, you know, soul as the individual manifestation spirit if you like you see i've done these um you know in my healing work i've done um soul soul recovery so where a soul fragment yep. through a sure. trauma has, has literally shattered sure. there's been no or the, the soul yeah. hasn't shattered but a part of the person's kind of gone i'm not i'm not up for this i don't even want to be here i'm leaving mm -hmm. i had that and, experience yeah um and it it i i think you know a lot of the um, when people are feeling out of their body, they're feeling confused, they're not sleeping well. It's, you could, of course, you know, we can medicate them for this sort of thing. And there's various ways. But if you, if you look at it in many cultures, they say, no, the soul has just said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Absolutely. breaking off. I'm off. Um, yeah. And then the shamanic uh, journey is to yeah. go, go and um, bounce back. Yeah. I mean, I, right. you know, I, do you mind if I share a story? Uh, of course not. When, when Emma died, I, I was exhausted. I, be, I was crying all day, all, um, kind of all day. I mean, I, I was so tired, I could go out for one meal a day, and it lasted mm -hmm. a few days, and I was starting to get worried, because I'm like, I don't yeah. physically, I'm on my own in Hong Kong, I mean, I've got friends, yeah. but, it, yeah. you know, you don't reach out. And so sure. I did this journey yeah. where I imagined I was on my shamanic, you know, totem animal, you know, mm. and we went mm. into the, the death lands and mm. there in the death lands was this dead shadow and we picked it up and I said, I need this. Mm. I'm going to have to bring it back. And we carried it all the way back to me. And, and it took like five mm. minutes. It, didn't, it wasn't like, you know, there was no yeah. calming. Yeah. I just did yeah. an inner journey. Sure. And from that moment, I stopped crying. And for three days, I cried when I closed my eyes to sleep all night until the morning. Mm -hmm. And but wow. I was I was physically OK. And I go, you know, in a way, I mean, I know I'm telling the story, but in a way, that's why I'm sharing you know, and discover energy is I want people to know like this is some yeah. really, really amazing stuff that can happen. And that's Absolutely. Proof. that's like that's like I you know put your hand in fire proof that there's a different level to us. So you know you're not totally. gonna get you're not gonna get totally. with a psychotherapy yeah. with somebody who's a, like a, a a classical you know ABC Beck uh, approach 
classical mm -hmm. approach, and there's nothing wrong with the Beck approach, mm -hmm. yes, uh, the mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. CBT, yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy. But mm -hmm. for example, when somebody's saying, I want to include your soul, I want to, I want to see it, yes. I want to exactly. honor it, I want to, exactly. I want to bring you to your oneness, it's really beautiful. Well, exactly. And that, that's where my kind of soul work with people started because I was working and, and just to, just to say from what you've said, you know, I, I see codependency as the modern uh, ugly word for soul loss. You know, again, it's about parts of us splitting off and needing something outside of ourselves to feel complete, whether it's a relationship or bottle or whatever. And codependency you know, soul loss is, is a much nicer you're, word. When you're, when you, how would you, how would you paraphrase codependency? The, the I, I would say it's a rupture, rupture of the relationship with the self. So again, this fragmented splintering that you're talking about. So, mm. you know, when, when this part of the soul is left, as you've described, which I always say to people who think of near death experiences, you hear people floating above the bed in the hospital or mm. rape cases where women leave their bodies or shut down and mm. dissociate. It's the same, it's the same idea, of course. So the soul leaves to protect itself. Um, uh, but but the codependency isn't that when we 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 sort of uh, vampire off somebody else and we sort of say I'm gonna I need you to balance myself. I'm not sure. Well, that, that's an extreme. That's a pathological form of codependency. Okay. But we're you know we're all codependent to some degree because we're, none of us are enlightened yet. So you know until we're in fully enlightened and awake to our ourselves as consciousness itself, then. We are, by definition, codependent because we need things outside ourselves usually to make us feel better. You know, whether it's a, even it's as simple as a dinner out, you know, whatever it is, until we're in that place where we go, I don't need anything. There is mm. nothing I need because I feel whole and complete. Mm. And, mm. You know, which is a place I feel increasingly I'm getting to. Um, we, we are, by definition, codependent. And we, we're a codependent culture. There's no question about that. Mm. I mean, mm. you know, I mean, I know we're not going into what's happening in the world at the moment, but they're, they're, a lot of what governments are doing is highly codependent, you know, nanny states. Yeah. You know? to, to me, I mean, like, especially not going in on, uh, into what's going on in the world, I, I think it's always been going on. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's more conscious now. Hopefully. We're seeing I mean, it more. We, hopefully, you know, uh, there is a change in consciousness. And, and so my, my, my goal is to be, framing it positively so like yeah. let's raise yeah. our consciousness yeah yeah, yeah. um but I w yeah i wanted to just quickly answer speak to that play thing you 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 uh, started to address about working with soul with people and i was saying that i started consciously doing that i was probably doing it unconsciously before but consciously doing it when i was a therapist at the priory in roehampton in london which you know right. and and i would see you know what we call recidivists you know people who would you know, come back again and again into treatment. And what would happen is that the institution, because of its own limitations, would usually say, oh, these people think they're special and different, they're not getting it. And they would blame the client. And that would always incense me. And I would always think, now, hang on a minute. It, just because the, the structure and the consciousness of the organization doesn't get it, it doesn't mean the client's wrong. So, and I would be always wanting to find out well, what's going on at a deeper level with these clients. So mm -hmm. I had an instinct that the wounds that we couldn't find in them were not from this lifetime. The wounds that they were carrying that were affecting their behavior, you know, were much more about past life wounding. So, you know, and then I started to work with that. And then, and then when I started doing talks at the Priory about the soul and how the soul, you know, comes into physical form. And later on, I introduced the astrology. I also did a three years of a training called deep memory process with the late Roger Wolger, who was a brilliant Jungian mm. academic who started this kind of body work process, which was a mixture of regression and Reiki and body work and a number of other things, but he died sadly. So I didn't finish the training, but, but I, I knew enough about past life work to start talking about it. And, and I, what I find with those clients, Rich, is that they were so pleased. They said, oh, at last someone gets it. Someone gets that I'm not just this grubby addict. I'm a soul struggling with something. And that maybe there are, there is a way out of this. You know, maybe if we look in the right place for the roots of this disorder, we can find a way out. And that's when I really started getting interested in it more and more because it spoke mm. to them. You know, if they right. were ready, not everyone, but if they were ready to hear that language of the soul, a lot of them went, wow, this is what I needed to hear. 
Now, this puts things in context for me because we're talking about context in the way, aren't we? Mm. You know, and I always think if we have a big container as a therapist, then the container does the work. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, what uh, enters my mind is it's a wonderful reframe. You know, it's exactly. like you're not, exactly. you're not sick, you're on a journey. Yeah. Yeah, I that's mean, right. And, and everything part of has your journey is going through this difficulty. Totally, and, totally. And, um, and maybe you and, even chose it before you were born. Yeah, and and so there's that. Uh, I was talking talking this morning about non-resistance. Um, um, that that whole concept of uh, if somebody says you're fat and ugly, you go, "Oh, I agree." Instead of going, yeah, <laughs> I, I find myself sometimes I look in the mirror, I go, Oh, yes, I definitely have yeah, looked yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not well, Eckhart Tolle talks about this, doesn't he? Eckhart Tolle talks oh, about he? this, about just letting things go through you. You know what people say, don't, don't resist, don't hold on to anything, just let it pass mm. through you. Yeah, oh, that's nice. And of course, Freud, Freud invented coined the term resistance to after working with these uh, neurotic Viennese women and seeing you know, how resistance works and how we deny truth to ourselves in order to protect mm. our core. You know, for, uh, sorry, But you're also ahead. working with these archetypes, aren't you? You're quite interested in this uh, union. So it's sort of, for me, it's like, yeah. I mean, how did you get from, from um, a out-of-body experience when you were three yeah. to and there's all this background how did you get and i know i keep on coming back to it but it's, oh. it's like how did you get to uh change from being a writer in a regional and even a broadsheet to becoming a psychotherapist i mean w was it through your own suffering and saying like because i always felt like i did psych my psychotherapy degree as a mm. you know a way of avoiding me doing therapy <laughs> because you know, I was going to have to look at myself. Yeah, You're going to have to look at you. do that horrible thing. So I, yeah, and I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. yeah, therapy would have been cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 well, the first thing that happened is I went into rehab when I was 26. You know, I went into oh. rehab, and and I would sit in group therapy, and I would think, hang on, I can do this better than you guys. So, and that, and that sounds arrogant, but it was I, you know, because of my sensitivity and the things that had happened to me. And again, I'll connect it with this flying fire out of my body. Yeah. Maybe I could see some things that other people couldn't see. So I had a, right. I had something, an experience, I guess, in my soul that the, a lot of the counselors I noticed didn't have. Mm. So I could hear what was the, the undercurrent of what the clients were saying, and I noticed they couldn't. Mm. So at that point, I thought, hang on, I enjoy this. I'm, I'm highly sensitive. I can do this. Why don't I think about doing it? And uh, I... Uh, uh, I started, I was editor of the newspaper in my town at this point in 92. Uh, and I, no, actually I was deputy editor then. I would drive 80 mile round trip twice a week to Birmingham to go to night school to do this counseling training. So that's how it started. I was madly enthusiastic about it. I was passionate about it. I was passionate about helping people. Um, because the one thing about working in newspapers is, especially when I became an editor, the public hates you, the staff hates you, and the management hates you. And being right. a very sensitive person, that didn't really work for me. You know, I wanted to right. do something where I had a more personal connection with people, and I felt I was good at this, I had a natural gift for it, and when I did my training, they said, well, you have a natural gift for this. So that's how it started. I did the night school thing, and a few years later, I was offered a, a trainee counselling Thing at the rehab I'd been in so they obviously recognized something in that I could do it so then I did that for a year so that's where it really started I'm curious like why you would why um, you would attribute this out-of-body experience as a three-year-old um, because you know I often I often be uh, doing um, energy work um, and I'll find that I've gone somewhere in my mind and got some information. I mean, it's like a little journey and I'll be telling them what I've, what I've picked up. And I'm wondering if you, I'm just curious, like you're doing the same thing. <laughs> well, well, so what's the question exactly? Well, are you doing the same thing? Are you going like, do you feel like you sometimes like nip out of your body, go down the shops, pick up 
you know, uh, go on the, the spiritual internet, enter some inform some questions about the person that's there. Like, why are they like that? And then the information comes and you come back and give it to them. Or is it? I don't, I, it's not, it's not like a download with me. You know, it's, okay. I don't have that. I don't, I'm not a gifted in that way. I wouldn't say it's just okay. as that you are. I'm, I wouldn't say I am. It's more of, uh, I think because my experience was, you know, my family. I mean, the other thing, my parents were both born on the same day. They were born on September the 8th, which is the Virgin Mary's birthday. So I had this strange kind of divine feminine part of it as well going on. And that's also the day the spiritual teacher I love, Miss Agadatta, died. So I had this whole September the 8th thing going on as well, which was very strange. Wow. Yeah. So, so there was always this sense of, well, hang on, there's something going on here hmm. and in my life. And, and, uh, and I think that what, and it's hard to explain to people, that experience of being catapulted far away from the earth in consciousness as a very small child. You know, I think the way I wrote about it was, it's like, it, if you take it as a circumference far around the earth, some of us have little circumferences around the earth in our mm. consciousness, others have slightly bigger ones. And I had a huge circumference from this experience. So, it, and, and I always think, well, you know, oh, get it. within I... that circumference, I can, he I can help heal what's within that circumference, which is a lot. But, but you, know. you know, the picture I get, Simon, is like mm. that you, you were shot out to the stars and then later you worked out, oh, I need to go out to the stars. Yeah, I need to get yeah. the star information. Ah, we'll that's call it great like insight. planetary, in, planetary yeah, yeah, information, yeah, 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 yeah. which yeah, is yeah. this childhood. It's it's uh, this circle of the child. That's right. Turning that's to right. the returning exactly. to the. Well, that's a great. I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, that's a great insight. And they call you know uh, in Mongolian culture they call the shaman skywalkers. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. So it's like going into the stars yeah. and going. What will they say? It, the it, stars are another realm. Yeah, I mean, I always had this mystical thing. I, I guess I always, you know, I didn't know then until I didn't have the language, but I realized that I was a mystic, you know, and, and, and I don't mean that in any grand way, but a mystic in the sense that the world was never going to be enough for me. I always wanted mm. something else. So, and the other thing about that experience, I would say there's a great phrase which says a mystic swims in the same waters that a psychotic drowns in. Mm. So, you know, I, I was obviously drowning in my drinking from that experience and the other experience that happened after it later on, which included being a confidant in my mother's affair when I was 10 years old, all sorts of awful stuff. So, so you know, I, I had a very difficult package of stuff to deal with. But there was this sense of uh, there's some meaning and purpose to all of this. I'm going to use this one day. And I had that as a child. You know, there, there is, you know, even though at times I was so low and depressed, I felt there was this tiny little flicker of light in me, just keeping me alive like a pilot light only. I knew one day it would, it would, I, I knew I was going to survive and I knew it would flourish at some point. Mm. Didn't know yeah. how. I mean, it's, it's, um, I find it's quite an inspiring picture in my mind that you've, you know, where you've gone through these different phases, you've gone to this you know, turbulent phase, um, self-destructive phase, um, mm -hmm. and then making making amends in a way, making amends with the um, the forces which were tearing you apart. So, yeah. like meeting the shadow yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah, and I've so, done quite a lot of shadow work. Yeah. So what what advice do you give to somebody when they're going through this, or you know what how how should they if Suddenly I said, I want to try and work out what's going on. Yeah. You would say, oh, come and see me. Or would you say, I would, um, would you say like one option is come and see me, but follow your heart or would you oh, say, always, 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 you know, if something speaks to you and calls you, you know, go with that, develop that intuition, you know, go with that. I would say, come and see me because of the experience I have personally and professionally, you know, now, um, but for me, you know, life is about love i knew that as a child i knew that my mm. outrage at what happened in my family is because i already knew somewhere in my dna i knew something about love i, I knew this wasn't how life was supposed to be mm. people lying and deceiving and fighting i knew that wasn't right and i was outraged by it and that mm. outrage came from a very pure place in me it came from a place of knowing something better um and i would say to people you know hold on to that hold on to 
you know, and maybe you haven't had, obviously you've had a very different experience than me, most people, but, you know, work on making what is in your unconscious conscious. Mm. Work on making what, and if we think about it astrologically, the planets close to the Earth, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Venus, you know, teach personal lessons. They're your personal astrology. Whereas the outer planets, the transpersonal planets, are generational planets. So in each person, there's a chunk of them that's the individual, and there's a bigger chunk of them that's the part of the collective experience of mankind. Mm. So, you know, most people are chock full of conditioning, I find. Hmm. Many people find it hard to question their conditioning. Many clients, the ones who don't usually do very well, are not good at, at, at holding their parents up to scrutiny. They say, oh, no, we mustn't go there. Mom and dad did their best. So they, they all adopt a form of denial, you know, out of this kind of honor thy father and mother creed that we have. And right. they don't understand. And I always say, honor thy father and mother is about honoring the soul of your parents. It's not honoring their dysfunction. You know, you need to think about if you want your family tree to mutate into something healthier, mm. you need to look at, you know, as Jung said, we look at the shadow for a reason. You know, we need to look at what hasn't worked. You know, we need to look at what we've hidden and pushed under the carpet. Mm. You know, and we need, even though it hasn't necessarily come from us, but from our ancestors, our job is to take responsibility for it. And in that way, as Maladama Somme, the African teacher taught me, he said, you know, the healing of trauma cascades up and down the family tree. Oh, yeah. you know, it'll heal the dead it'll you know so yeah just yeah. you know work at work at that level and that's yeah. what i you know i try and do i mean i you know because i get um the uh, the feedback i've had talking with you know friends mutual friends that have seen you they've mm. they've said like um they haven't gone specifically with a problem but they you'd given them insights into um a little bit more the mechanics of what was going on in their lives and they were they came away a little bit nicer to themselves in a way. You know what I mean? Like, good. Well, that's so, a good thing. Um, so, I mean, for me, I'd, I'd say, like, if you're curious from that point of view, it's also, you know, you, you, there's a whole... Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, like, the, yeah. the astrology doesn't have to be, like, it can be a part of just explaining things with it's your understanding of, of all the archetypes yeah. from, a, from a Jungian yeah. perspective. Yeah, it's a part of it. I like to start there because it saves a lot of people time and money in therapy because you get a very good foundation at the beginning. And I write it all up for them as well. So, you know, which is unusual. So they get a, they get a lot for it. And it, it, it's, I mean, once you, because, you know, in the evolutionary astrology, you can look at what your soul's purpose is in this life what it's been and where it's failed in past lives, where you've been mm. locked, you know, and some of the, some of the gravitational pull back to those old behaviors. And mm. so really, again, it's making the unconscious conscious. And that's what I would say to anyone. The whole journey is to, is, is about light. It's bringing more light into you. It's, mm. it's stopping looking mm. into the physical world, which is a realm of reflected light. It's looking into the heart, the light in the heart and growing that mm. because as any mystic will tell you, as you know, the, the whole of the universe is inside the heart. Now, obviously that doesn't happen physically, it happens in consciousness. So if we can fan the light in the heart, you know, mm. we can wake up and see our mm. history and our family's history as much mm. as we can, that can really help us. And that's where psychotherapy is good. And a lot of people are very e eager to dismiss it these days, with lots of modern mm. fangled quick things. But I don't like a quick fix, Rich. You know, I, I wrote in one of my pieces, you know, I want you slow cooked or not at all. Mm. Because it's the slow cooking of the human being that really heals, you know, and I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, commentary. Um, it's a valid point um, and uh, it's wonderful it's been really wonderful uh, talking to you and I think I think, too, could, I think we could talk for another hour we could it. we probably could Maybe we should do another one sometime yeah, we can we can great, great. mate um, thank you so much um, Pleasure. if if people want to get hold of you do you have a website just to give it a shout out yeah it's called soul vision one word s-o-u-l vision dot co dot uk yeah. And they can uh, get on there and you can... Um, There's a contact your, form and all that stuff, yeah. Right, you can explore yeah. your soul path, your soul purpose. Sure. And, sure. Yeah. And yeah. it's international because we're on the internet. So Absolutely. Yeah. I'm are. working with a lot of people in America at the moment. And, awesome. Yeah. Mate. Ah, it's good to see you. Thank you so much. You. Yeah, wonderful. Enjoyed it a lot. See you soon.